1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to read a little bit, so don't tune out on me. I really want you to hear the words of the Apostle Paul as we focus on the family today. We're going to talk about the family, but not just your family, but the family, the family of God. So the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12, the body is a unit. Though it is made up of many parts, and though it is all its parts are many, they form one body, shout one. So it is with Christ, for we are all baptized by one spirit. Say one. Into one body. There you go. Whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, we were all given one. Somebody say one. One spirit to drink. Now, the body is not made up of many, uh, I'm sorry, is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would no longer for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? You get the point, right? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged a part. Listen, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Don't change who you are to fit in. Right? You got a place here. You got to find your fit. Don't change your size, color, style. I don't know. Don't, don't change. Be you. We need you. We don't need a person next to you. We need you. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Don't ever underestimate uh, somebody that you think is not significant. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. We did that the past few minutes. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So there should be no division in the body. I've never seen a church divided because they honored too much. He's talking about honor here being the remedy for unity. Very interesting. But his part should have equal concern. Somebody say equal. We'll talk about that in a second. He said if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. And then finally he says in verse 27, now you, come on, touch somebody say you, are the body of Christ and each one of you is part of it. I want to begin by saying that at Free Life, I believe we're more than a church. We're a family. I really, I really do. I've experienced that. I've seen about the, the church operate as a house of God. And how many know there's a different, difference between a home and a house? You can have brick and mortar and have a house, but you have to have certain ingredients to make a home. And a church can be the same way. A church can be the house of God, but not be the family of God. I believe free life's a family. And as much as my own blood relatives, you're family to me. You're my family. You really, really more. Because, I, you know, I'm stuck with my crazy uncle. But... But I get, to, I get to choose you. You see, you see, our blood relatives are family by birth. And we should honor them and love them. As hard as it is sometimes. Right? But our, our church family is our family of choice. You chose me. I chose you. We choose to do this every week. We don't have to. This is a family reunion that you, you don't, not obligation, but we love each other. We genuinely love each other around here. And it's like the more you get to know free lifers, the more you love them. How many ever been around somebody that you loved them at first? <laughs> but then the more you got to know them, you didn't love them as much. But that's different here. It really is. And, and actually, there's a lot of times that, you know, our... I, we can be even more family here than our blood relatives. Now, I don't mean that more important. I'm just saying we spend more time, a lot of times, with each other here at the house of God and the family of God than really than we do 
you know, our extended family. I'm not talking about our family in our household. I'm talking about our uncles, aunts, cousins, relatives. A lot of times we don't spend as much time with them as we do here. And how many know this? That we love them and God bless them and we want to reach our family, but they don't know Jesus. We're not going to be hanging with them for eternity. This is the family of choice because we're going to be hanging with each other. You stuck with me. We're going to be hanging out 24-7 for eternity together. How do you like that? You, some of you can only handle me one time a month. You're going to be with me every hour, every day. Yes, you are. We have eternity and after all, really, the church family is related by blood, too. It's just not our blood, but it's his blood. You know, no longer what connects us is not color, is not skin, is not race, is not styles, is not all, it's not all the things that, you know, uh, a lot of times you would think would connect. What, what's, what connects us when you're in the family of God is not my DNA, it's not my blood and your blood, but his blood that connects us, and how many know his blood is not red, is not black or white or brown, his blood is red, right? And so we have his blood running through our veins, and some of you may have never experienced a healthy, happy home, a healthy, happy family. I did. I, I was blessed. I was spoiled rotten. Uh, I have a, have a great upbringing. I have only great memories of the way I was raised, had a healthy, happy, you know, thriving family home, but I'm aware that a lot of times we didn't get blessed like that. We may have not have seen uh, the ingredients, the characteristics growing up in a home, uh, in a healthy family. And like I said earlier, there's a difference between just growing up in a house and growing up uh, in a home. And one of our mission statements here at Free Life is to be big enough to reach the world, but yet small enough to feel like home and to be a family. So I want to give you five key ingredients, very quickly, five ingredients to a healthy family. Now, interestingly enough, this is not only a healthy family for your family at home, but a healthy church family as well. Five key ingredients for a healthy family, and watch this now, these are also benefits. In case you wondered if, if the church family brings value to you or not, I'm going to give you five benefits. These are five characteristics of a, of a healthy family, uh, of a healthy church family. But also, they're the blessings, the benefits from being part of the family. Number one is caring for one another. We care for one another. Healthy church families care for one another. Verse 25, Paul said that we in the family of God should have equal concern for one another. That means it, whether they're black, brown, or white, no matter how many zeros are at the end of their paycheck each week, we have equal concern for one another. We have equal concern whether we know the family member or not. We have equal concern for one another. He said when one hurts, we all hurt. That's why we prayed earlier for these tragic events taking place around the world because the family of God doesn't stop in Forney at Free Life Church at 1032 East Highway 80. The family of God is all around the world. So we have an equal concern when one hurt, we all hurt. But watch this. I think this is more of a challenge. When one is honored, we all celebrate. It's, it's, it's easy to hurt and help somebody when you, you almost feel empowered. We're, we're good people. I don't mean that, you know, it's, it's a bad thing, but you want to help people, right? People want to help people, and you want to help somebody, and you feel empowered. You feel, that's why, that's why the Bible says more blessed to give than to receive, because you get more blessed when you give. But what about when, when that person gets the car you've been praying for? What, what about when that person is doing better than you, and you need their help? What about when they get the job promotion that you've been praying and fasting for and you gave a sacrificial seed to, and they got it and you didn't? See, it's easier to hurt when others hurt than it is to rejoice when others rejoice. When we don't see one of our family members here on a Sunday, do we have concern? Those are key ingredients of a healthy church family healthy family do we do we do we reach out do we call do we say well I know you're on vacation but we still missed you I know you're at the at the lake but we still missed you we, we hope it rained and stormed on you we 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 still missed you 
And for them to see that something was missing because they weren't here, that's what a family does. If we go to bed at night and all of my kids are not accounted for, I, I need medicine. Right? A family cares. A family is concerned when they don't see one of their own there. And like I told you Wednesday night, I was going to reveal this Tuesday, we have an all-day staff meeting plan. Pray for our staff because of an all-day staff meeting plan and talking about nets. Each one of you, whether you sign up or not, you ain't going to give you a chance to sign up. You don't have to sign up. We're, every one of you are going into a net, and we're going to prove our concern for you. We're going to prove that we care for you because when something happens, we can't be prophets. you got to tell us. But when you have something going on in your life, you get sick, you need to have a prayer request, you a hospital or whatever it may be, we're going to make sure, listen, we want to be big enough to reach the masses, but we also want to feel like home and feel like family, and, and we're already, let me tell you, we got about a thousand people in this church, and, and it's, I say this humbly, I'm not saying this arrogantly, but this is the reality. We've seen God do what he's done on a Sunday show, pretty much, unless you're really connected and really involved, it's the Sunday show that brings us together every week, the song and dance, the preaching, the kids' ministry. And maybe a few of you serving in parking and, and ushers and greeters and everything. Now, that's not important. It's important. I wonder what would happen if we really started connecting to one another and really started feeling like family. I got your back. You got my back. Preacher don't have to show up. I got 10 of my best friends at the hospital. So, concern for one another. Number two, healthy church families hang together. They spend time together. Not because they have to, not because they need to, but they want to. They go to church outings like picnics tonight. You know I'd throw that in there. You know, the dream team fellowships, our, our, or, but also organic relationships. I mean, you know, this ain't a church event, but you want to go to Chili's after church today, you know, and, and just hanging together. I, and well, I don't know these people. That's your problem. You've got to get to know them. You know, walk up to somebody. I'm, obviously, we've got something in common. We're here together this morning. And, and before long, you become a family because you're hanging together. I remember going by, dropping off some of my books. I was about to uh, preach at Tony Brock's church in Georgia uh, the next day. And it was a Saturday morning, and they were having a car wash, I think, for the, for the choir or something, and a bake sale for the youth or something. It was, it was a few years ago, and, and, and it was like it made a pastor so envious. It was like Medea's reunion. How many's ever seen Medea? It was just so cool. Like they were all out there and they were all happy and they were all, and I thought at the time, now we've come a long way since then, but I thought at the time, I'm like, man, I, if we had a car wash or a bake sale on a Saturday, I'd be getting all kinds of complaints. I got football on Saturday. I got baseball on Saturday. Why do you want me to come up there anyway? You know, the church needs more money. And I mean, there's all kinds of complaints and we get about two show up. And they had the whole parking lot slammed of people because they genuinely wanted to hang together. When we hang together, we're stronger. There's power in numbers. That's why the writer of Hebrews said, don't forsake coming together. We're better together. Because I'm telling you, you find the value of what I'm talking about when you go through a trial and Satan hits. Then you find out what Abraham Lincoln was talking about when he said, we better all learn to hang together or we will surely all hang separately. <laughs> so we got to stay together. That's why it concerns me when I see people that really don't have a need for the local church. Oh, they'll show up on Sunday for the show. But they, what are you investing in somebody else's life through the week at Free Life for the family? You do it for a stranger? Let's be a family. <laughs> I won't say that. Y'all just celebrated my birthday. I want to be nice. You need to take the next step and be a part of this family. That's all I'll say. You, unbreakable. Unbreakable. You'll see in a few minutes I'm, I'm creating an acronym. Unbreakable. Healthy church families are unbreakable. We may fight. We may fuss. We may disagree. But at the end of the day, we're going to make things right because this family is more important than my feelings. 
I got my feelings hurt. I got offended. I got upset because, you know, Sister Betty took my parking place out there. And, and I used to kill in the front row. And now they got more people coming. I'm not important anymore. They put me on the second row now. And, you know, people used to complain because we made them sit on the front. Now they're complaining because we don't have a seat on the front. And it's just, you know. And, and the reality is you're not family until somebody has hurt your feelings around here and you stay. Some of you are cute. Some of you think free life is all that. It don't, nobody's, nobody's messed with you yet. You let somebody offend you. You, you. you let me preach on something you don't like. You let me do something, or not just me, but somebody else, a leader, or and they call themselves a leader, and he talked to me like that. I'm telling you, that's when we find out, are you family, or are you just a casual friend? Because families stay together. Families are unbreakable. Families figure it out. And they say, we, you know, I may, not, I may not like you, but we're family. What, what, makes, what makes a family unbreakable? Number one, passionate love. I love you. I want to whip you, but I love you. I, I, I forgive you. Frequent forgiveness. And a reckless commitment. <laughs> I don't like what you're doing, but I'm committed to you. I don't like what you said, but it's reckless commitment. You see, I'm, what I'm preaching right now is Greek out there. Because most people are as loyal and faithful and dedicated as, as yesterday. What have you done for me lately? Not what you do for me last month. Not how, man, they were there for you in your darkest time, but what have you done lately? And so healthy families are unbreakable. Say amen, somebody. Healthy church families are rewarding. There are great rewards for not being breakable, for staying. There are great rewards for staying together and being family and watching our little youngins grow up together. Watching our kiddos grow up from, I mean, I thought about the McDonald's. Well, you only had two, right? If, if you want babies, don't come to free life because y'all had two when you came here. Now, you're, now you got five. That can just get around. If you need a baby, just go be at free life for a while and So, there are great rewards. You, got, you have go-tos. You know what go-tos are, right? When, not if, but when you go through the storm or the trial, you have a go-to. Because you know what, you know what the, 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 the sinner, well-meaning friend at work's going to say? I'm thinking about you. Thinking about me is not going to do any good. Having sympathy for me is not going to do any good. I need somebody that can get in the trenches and believe God with me. I need a miracle. I need God to restore my home. I need God to fix my body. I got a doctor's report, and it's, it looks like I'm going to die. I don't need you to think about me. I need to be part of a family of believers that will agree God and touch heaven with me. That's what the family of God is does i i've heard so many athletes that talk about the loneliness after winning a championship heard one catcher one time i'm sorry i'm sorry i said that wrong he was a pitcher won game seven of the world series and went back to the hotel room and almost took his life because the rush was over he had all of his teammates out on the field they were all celebrating and he's divorced his kids don't want anything to do with him and he goes back to the room, and he has nobody to celebrate with. You don't just need the family of God during the lows. You need the family of God to celebrate with you. I mean, I mean who's going to be there at your 50th wedding anniversary? Who's going to come to your kiddos' weddings and bring gifts? Because those stingy people out in the world won't. Oh, they'll give to Brad and Angelina, but they won't give to you. They're stingy. But when you get part, that's why I love selfless givers, generous people, because that's what I am. I'm not tooting my own horn. I'm just telling you, that's what a Christian does. 
A Christian doesn't count the nickels and dimes and say, oh, I'm not sure. I'm not gross or net. What do I give on? What do I tie? That's, that's not what a Christian A Christian is a giver. That's why I want to surround myself with people that are givers. Because you get what you give. You reap what you sow. That's why when my girls get married, you got to look over at your, your, some of you are going to have kids, and you're going to have a wedding, and there ain't going to be nothing on that gift table. My gift table is going to be loaded down. Why? Not because I'm the preacher, but I'm a giver. Who's going to celebrate with you? If you're not part of the family of believers, then where does the value of life come from? There's no point. You don't need to go to church to go to heaven. I'm not even talking about that. Let's not even go there. I, I, I'm talking about here on earth. You ain't going to heaven today, I hope. We need each other now. Man, I'm preaching right now. It's a birthday anointing I got on me. That's what it is. When my dad, when my dad was taken, I talked about this last week, and he was killed in a car wreck. I remember, y'all, with your kids. Taking the drive. I remember the others in this church. I don't want to call names. But I remember what it did to me when I turned around and I saw free lifers in Snellville, Georgia, 12, 13 hours away. I'm a crybaby, man. Y'all, y'all, y'all texted me Friday. Jeremy, I was in the gym, and I was like, my God, they got to stop texting me. I am so soft. I'm getting old. I'm like, it was a post. That's all it was. All it was is a post. And I'm like. You don't understand what I'm talking about until you need this. And then you see the value of it. I'm just hoping there are people that you're connecting with now. Because I'm going to tell you what you're going to be. You're going to be another offended Christian that the preacher didn't come visit you. The preacher ain't supposed to. I, I know you may have came from a denomination. The preacher did everything. That's why y'all had us four no more. If you want to reach the masses, preacher can't be at everything. But we can. Number four. Healthy church families communicate. They talk. They communicate their feelings. Come on, can you think about it? I'm talking about a real uh, blood family, not real family. I insinuate we're not. But I'm talking about blood relatives, your husband and wife, and you don't communicate? It's like the husband and wife that wanted to get a, a divorce and 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 she was mad at him and she went to the the lawyer and the lawyer said lady what does he do does he do you do you have grounds and she she said about an acre and a half he said he said no no do you do you does he beat you up no no i get up before him every morning about an hour do, does he, I mean, no, lady, you understand. Do you have a grudge? And she said, a three-car. He said, lady, tell me, why do you want to get a divorce? And she said, he just can't seem to communicate right. <laughs> can't, can't seem to communicate right. We got to communicate with one another. Healthy families communicate their dreams to one another. They communicate their problems to one another, their ideas, their vision. Healthy church families are always communicating love. Healthy church families are always communicating acceptance. I don't accept uh, everything you have done. I don't accept everything you're doing. I don't accept that friend. I don't accept that boyfriend. I don't accept that girlfriend. But I accept you. I, 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 don't, I don't agree with everything that you're doing, but I love you. I believe in you. I support you. I forgive you. I have faith in you. That's what healthy families do and that's what healthy church families do we communicate we may not always agree on everything you know the ark of the covenant he said i want them to i want them to have i want the two seraphs at the end of each each side of the ark if you read this in exodus he's telling moses i, I want them to face one another but i want you to tilt their heads down 
Why? Because down at the bottom of the mercy seat was the blood, was the, was the, uh, the, the it represented the blood of Christ, but it was the, the mercy seat. You had the Ark of the Covenant, and at each end of the Ark of the Covenant was a seraph, like an angel looking. You've seen the Ark of the Covenant. If you not, you can Google it. You can see a, a replica. And he said, I don't want you looking at one another. I want you focusing on the blood. Because we may not see eye to eye on everything, but you don't have to see eye to eye to walk hand in hand. Healthy church families, that's my buddy right there. Healthy church families communicate. We communicate according to our audience. I don't know about you, but I just don't communicate the same with Leanne as I do my dog. I mean, you know, I'd be in trouble. Maybe not, because our dog's treated pretty good, but you understand the point. Uh, I, don't, I, I won't communicate with my daughters the way I would Uncle Joe. We communicate according to our audience. Healthy church families communicate according. We communicate differently to teenagers than we do senior adults. We communicate differently to a business person than we do blue collar culture. Uh, um, I communicate. Watch this. I communicate differently in here on Sunday mornings than I would a one on one taking you deeper in the Word of God or in an intense discipleship class. Why? Because some of you just getting in the water. I don't need to take you in the middle of the Atlantic. I, I'm gonna drown you. So I gotta communicate according to my audience. Anybody with me? That's why I appreciate Joel. No matter what you think about him, Joel Osteen, he communicates according to his audience. He knows his audience on Sunday mornings is a broad net and people watching all over the world. Jimmy Fallon watches him every Sunday night. I've heard him say it more than one time. Every Sunday night, Jimmy Fallon says he watches Joel Osteen. Now, I don't know Jimmy Fallon. Maybe he's, maybe he's a scholar. But I got a feeling that's the reason he watches Joe Osteen because he finally turned on a preacher that he gets. We got to learn to communicate the right way according to our audience. And last but not least, healthy church families have a culture of honor. They know how to honor. We honor our Heavenly Father. How do we honor our Heavenly Father? You know, He's the Father of the family. How do we honor our Heavenly Father? We serve in His house. So let me, let me, let me, let me shake you up a little bit. That's why we took my offering first. <laughs> let me shake you up for a second. If the way, one of the ways you show honor to your Heavenly Father is by serving in His house, what are you doing when you don't serve in His house? We think we got to do some big, bad sin to dishonor the Lord. No, he's saying, you're saying my house is not worth doing something. I can't imagine telling Donnie Mullis, son, I want you to cut the grass, and by the time I get home, I want that yard mowed. I can't imagine saying, well, Daddy, let me see it. I'll pray about it, and I'll see if I feel led. I, I mean, I wouldn't have teeth to smile with this morning. I just wouldn't. I can't imagine Take out the trash, boy. Well, Dad, let me go pray about it. He'd say, well, I'm going to give you something else to pray about while you're there. No, this is the house that you eat. This is the house that keeps you warm at night. Therefore, you got some chores to do, boy. Or girl. We honor the Lord by giving of our resources. Proverbs chapter 3 makes it very clear to honor the Lord with our substance, with our resources. So once again, if that's one of the way you honor the Lord, what are you doing when you don't give of your resources? See, we think we got to go kill 30 people to dishonor the Lord. It's, we don't have to do something bad necessarily. Sometimes it's do nothing at all. You know, the easiest way for a ship to drift from dock, do nothing. Easiest way for a knife to become dull? Just do nothing. It's not like you got to do something to become dull or to drift. 
good word. I wouldn't plan on saying that either. We worship the Lord with our lifestyle. We honor, we show honor to our Heavenly Father by the way we live. Thank God for lifted hands, and we should do it. We should sing on Sunday morning. We should worship God. But Romans 12, the Apostle Paul said it. I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, which is your reasonable act, holy and acceptable, which is a reasonable act of worship. It's not unreasonable to worship the Lord out there with your life the way that you sing about in here one day a week. He goes with you. I'm going to sound old school. I don't want to be old school. I don't want to be new school either. He goes with you to that rated R movie. Man, that is, I mean, back then, the whole church would be applauding back when I was growing up. Now it's like, did he just say rated R? He goes with you when you go watch what you do late at night when nobody's watching. He hears the gossip, not necessarily, because how many of gossip is also listening? He, he, he hears the gossip you're entertaining. And we don't have none of that in this church, thank God. We have a little motto around here. United we stand, divided you leave. It's easy. It's easy. We honor one another. Y'all have honored me today. But that's not just about me. It's a culture that we have in this house that we honor. We honor our dream teamers, don't we? We have our dream team nights. We also have our galas. We have gift cards. I, I honor department leaders with gift cards. I mean, I'm talking about fat gift cards. If you just saw what I honored Cassie, our administrator, with this past week, you'd have been like, it was administrator's day. I, I, I'm trying to get better at this stuff, and she's our personal assistant. So Leanne and I wanted to honor her. And it's interesting because Sydney just got her wisdom teeth taken out uh, this past week, and all of a sudden, I said, Cassie had her some gift over there, and Gabby brought her a gift Wednesday night, I think it was. And, I mean, she's getting Starbucks gift cards. And I'm like, I need my wisdom teeth taken out. But it's an honor thing. And at the same time, I'm honoring Cassie. They're honoring Sydney. I come in the green room Wednesday night, and it's all balloons and decor set up for a video shoot. And they told me it was for my video, for what y'all just saw earlier. And I'm thinking, man, what a culture of honor that we honor one another. It ain't about the Richie show. It's about honoring one another. <laughs> Staff, we do bonuses and give time off. Just an honor thing. I want, I want to leave you with this because I'm six minutes over. I, I want to leave you with this. Y'all took too long to celebrate me. That's what it was. Just remember, just remember. That video was about 20 minutes, wasn't it? Okay. N notice this. I want you to put my acronym. Look, look what is the ultimate, the ultimate family. The far left, everything I just gave you makes up the word church. Now, I want you to look at something. What are the two letters, the two middle letters in church? Remember our final verse we read in 1 Corinthians 12 earlier, verse 27. Paul said, you are the body of Christ. The church is not something you come to. The church is something you are. The church is a powerful force when we all get the reality that we take church out. We come to church on Sunday because we get filled up. We get fueled. But your car ain't going to go too far without stopping at a gas station and getting filled up. But then you, you don't just stay at the gas station all week. That would be weird. Can you imagine going in talking? <laughs> Can you imagine going into the tenant, you know, the attendant saying, what are you doing? He said, I just, just want to hang out. I just love gas stations. My car needed gas. So, of course, I'm going to be here. My car needed gas. <laughs> that attendant's going to say, well, yeah, but did you get your gas? Yeah. You got a purpose for that gas now. 
It's, it's the same thing now. We, we come into the house of God. We're not going to a church. We are the church. Just lean in for a second. I promise you I'm going to lean in, lean in. Jesus, we celebrated last week, the resurrection. You know why he was loaned his tomb? You know, Joseph Arimatheus loaned the tomb for Jesus to be buried in. Jesus borrowed the tomb. Why? Because he's a smart businessman. You don't buy something that you're only going to need for three days. So he borrowed the tomb because he would only need it temporarily. But 2 Corinthians says, Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. So basically what he's saying, Jesus borrowed the tomb because he would only need it temporarily. But he bought you because he wants to stay with you permanently and reside with you and go with you. Now I take him when I go to the gym. I take him when I go home. I take him with me out of this place because the church is not just something I go to, but the church is something I am. You are. Last but not least, put my acronym back up there. Notice, notice, the U stands for unbreakable, right? The R stands for rewards. You know why Satan wants to take you out of the family? He wants to break you because he wants to keep the rewards from you. Because if you'll stay in the family of God, figure out which one it is. Maybe it's not this one. I don't know. But if it, find one and stay in it and don't be breakable. Be unbreakable. Because when you're unbreakable, there are many rewards. Paul said in Ephesians that the inheritances that come with, you know, when my dad passed, he made a great impact on one of my best friends, best friends since third grade, still are, still great friends. And, and he came down and spoke at my dad's funeral. My dad made an impact almost as much as he made on me, he made on him. Because he had an alcoholic father. It was abusive. Mom and dad were divorced. He lived with his mom in our hometown. And, man, this, this, this guy had me crying at my dad's funeral and just the impact that he made. But it was all said and done. He went back to Washington, D.C., and I got the inheritance. He was impacted, but he wasn't a son. God says, I have rewards for you. Read the book of Ephesians. There are many inheritances and blessings that come with being part of the local family of believers. That's why you can't let anything Satan do to keep you out and take you out. Offense, apathy, priorities, high times, low times. You got to stay and don't be, un don't be breakable. You got to be unbreakable because there's many rewards that follow. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray if there's anyone in this room that doesn't know you, that's not part of the family of believers, that they understand that all they need to do is come to you, confess their sins, because you're faithful and just to forgive us. You said you'll graft us in to the body of Christ and the family of believers. Help us to understand the value and the significance of the local church. The greatest family of all. The family of God.